So, uh, hello, uh, welcome to this session where we will talk about the computational model of the Alphabil platform, which is basically the, the logic and architecture behind writing your own, uh, own distributed applications on the platform. Uh, my name is Ahtar Roo. I work as a software integration architect here in Gartime as part of the R&D team. And uh, I hope this will be a, a useful and interesting talk for you. So, uh, uh, first, uh, to, to put this programming model in the, in the context a little bit, uh, first a, a few words about the uh, general architecture of Alphabill. And uh, Alphabill's uh, architecture is, uh, is uh, based on this principle of hierarchical ledger consensus, where uh, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with the notion of the blockchain trilemma, where you can have scalability, security, and decentralization, and inside one blockchain system, you can have two out of those three. You cannot achieve all three simultaneously. And the way Alphabill uh, resolves this, uh, this trilemma is that the root chain uh, uh, provides uh, decentralization and security, but doesn't need to be scalable because scalability is handled by the hierarchical architecture by, uh, by putting uh, the majority of transactions or the actual transactions into, into partitions, uh, which, uh, which then uh, can be distributed and, and can, be, can be scalable. I will not go into much details about this because there is a separate presentation about uh, the consensus and, and the, the, this part of the architecture, but just to understand uh, the context in which uh, the following uh, programming concepts take place, then the partitions uh, implement transaction systems uh, where each uh, system can have its own transaction types and, uh, and their own validation rules. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, a transaction system uh, for the AB uh, Alphabill native currency has one set of, uh, of transaction rules, what kinds of things you can do with, uh, with the native currency bills. And, uh, and the, uh, the user token partition has a different set of rules. In particular, the rules for creating new tokens in, in those two partitions are quite different. And, and so uh, the, the partitions are uh, logical or, or uh, organizational or, or uh, uh, governance uh, divisions uh, of, of the state space uh, of the Alphabill uh, system. And then for scalability, each partition can further be divided into shards, where uh, within the different shards of the same partition, uh, the transaction logic is, is same, all the validation logic is same, and the, the splitting there is done purely for performance optimization reasons. But uh, as far as uh, capabilities of transactions, uh, capabilities of operations that you can do with a bill, it doesn't matter which shard is managing your particular bill or your particular token. Arthur, question? Yep. Uh, what do you mean by proof of unicity? Uh, proof of unicity? Uh, so uh, the root chain provides proof of unicity. Yes, this uh, means that uh, there is one version of the history of uh, all, all the transactions across all partitions. And we cannot, uh, cannot maintain multiple parallel histories. Yes, sorry, should have mentioned it already <laughs> without, uh, without asking, but uh, thanks for the question. And so if, if there is anything unclear in the following slides also, feel free to jump in with questions. So uh, the, the programming capabilities of Alphabill, basically they, they boil down, uh, at least in the, in the bill partitions uh, where, you, where you manage bills or, or, or tokens, which are assets you can own in, in, in more general terms, uh, the, the, the programmability is a programmable ownership. And this, uh, this means that uh, each, each bill has a, a predicate called the bearer predicate associated with it, which is basically a predicate, uh, if, in case you are not familiar with the term, it's, it's just a function which returns a Boolean value, yes or no, true or false. And, uh, and, uh, and the bearer predicate then is, is a function that uh, determines whether a transaction that wants to operate on a bill or, or on a coin or on a token, whether the transaction is valid, whether the transaction is allowed to go forward. And the simplest form of a bearer predicate is, uh, is a question, does a signature on the transaction order uh, validate against uh, given public K X? 
So this means basically whoever has a corresponding private key can sign the transaction order and can then transfer the bill or, or use it for payment or, or something like that. And anybody who doesn't cannot provide an input that, uh, that would satisfy the predicate and, and cannot transact. And uh, a transfer transaction then uh, replaces a current bearer predicate with a new one. And again, in the simplest case, when the, 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 when the bill was uh, previously owned by the, or controlled by the, by the owner or bearer of, uh, of, the public key, of the private key corresponding to public key X, the bill then, the, the predicate can be replaced with a similar predicate where just uh, it references a different public key. And then to, to, to further transfer the bill, uh, you would know the other private key. Yes, there is a question. How, how does this compare to, say, Bitcoin opcode? It sounds quite similar. Yeah, it is actually very similar. Uh, uh, and, and just like in, in Bitcoin's case, you can have this very simple, uh, simple predicate where the only thing you do is verify, uh, verify the signature on the transaction order by a public key, but you can also write more complicated scripts. And in fact, the scripting language uh, of AlphaBill uh, has been uh, influenced by, by all of those, all those uh, uh, bytecode-based virtual machines, which, uh, of which uh, Bitcoin virtual machine is an example, but also JVM for the Java programming language is an example. Uh, you, you may write your uh, application source code in a high-level language, but it gets compiled into into a, a bytecode script, and then the script gets executed on, on a stack-based virtual machine. And this is uh, also the execution model that we employ in the alpha build programmability model. So we have a bytecode with a stack-based execution model and input data for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for universi uh, university or uniformity. Uh, the input data for the predicates is, is given as the initial state of the data stack. So uh, in order to, uh, to push uh, or, or uh, to, to submit the signed transaction order, you push a signature onto stack, then you push the transaction order itself onto stack, and this initial state of the stack is the input to the predicate uh, that will then uh, evaluate whether the, whether the transaction is allowed to go forward. And, uh, and then in this case, uh, the, the bare predicate script to be, uh, to be executed might be, for example, uh, the first operation to hash the top of the stack, which pops the top element of the tack, stack, computes a hash value, and replaces the element on the stack with a, with a hash value. Uh, so uh, then uh, you can push the public key. So this uh, public key is part of the, of the uh, bearer predicate script. And, and the script pushes the public key to the stack and then executes a, a verify signature opcode. And then the verify signature opcode verifies, expects to have the stack on the stack a public key, a hash value, and a signature on the hash value, and then verifies whether the signature is, is a valid signature uh, created with a private key uh, corresponding to the given public key and returns true or false, whether the signature validates or not, and, and, uh, uh, and, and corresponding the transaction is allowed to go forward or is, is declared invalid and ignored. And uh, there is uh, a low-level assembly language, which is basically just a list of mnemonic commands uh, for the bytecode uh, operations, which is pretty much like the Bitcoin uh, scripting language. Uh, but uh, we expect uh, there will be in the future also higher-level convenience languages, which, which might be more like uh, depending on, uh, on who is developing those higher-level languages and what their, what their tastes are. There might be different flavors. There might be languages which are more like JavaScript, like Solidity, for example, uh, something in, in this, uh, this vein. But uh, there might also be a, a language, uh, perhaps a functional language, like Haskell, for, uh, for more mathematically-oriented developers. So uh, as long as a higher level language can be compiled into the bytecode, the, the execution environment doesn't care where the bytecode comes from. So this, is, uh, this gives quite a bit of flexibility. But this is, uh, in principle, could also be the case with, with Bitcoin scripting. And <coughs> uh, what, is, what is quite different in AlphaBill, because the whole uh, whole architecture and data model is based on this notion of uh, bills which are independent for each other. And, and the key to scalability is that the, the history and state of each, each bill can be verified independently of others. And there is no inter-shot synchronization. There is no global state. There is, uh, to, to, uh, 
to verify that there has been no double spending, you only have to look at the local history of this one bill and there is no, uh, no cross-shot dependencies or no inter-shot synchronization needed. And, uh, and this, this is key to alphabet scalability as, uh, as, as we have already explained in the, in the uh, alphabet uh, architecture talk. And uh, now if in, your, uh, if in your application program or in, in your applications that you want to build on top of the alphabet platform, if you need to have some sort of interaction, then the model is uh, that uh, different tokens or different uh, smart contracts, they communicate with each other based on the message passing model. And the message passing uh, is uh, expected to be performed by the uh, interested client application. So for example, uh, when, we, when we want to implement a transaction where somebody pays with, uh, pays with uh, Alphabill uh, native currency to, to buy a token, where the token is a user-defined token in another partition managed by another shard, and, and there is no, in, no, no communication between those two things, uh, those two shards, those two partitions inside the Alphabill platform itself. So uh, what, what's the buyer of the, of the of the token uh, might do. This is one example how you can implement this scenario. There are other ways to do it, but uh, just, just by way of a simple example, uh, the buyer can set uh, the, the predicate on the bill that, uh, that the buyer wants to use to pay for the token, uh, can set the predicate to this kind of uh, composite, uh, two clause composite, uh, composite condition. So uh, saying that if the block number is less, less than T1 and the token predicate is set to, to some X, uh, then uh, the key Y controls the bill. And this is now written here on the slide in a, in a high level uh, pseudocode. Uh, you could write the same thing in, uh, in, the, in the alpha bill bytecode, but then it would be, take a bit longer and, and be a lot less readable. So uh, we don't do this on the slide here. And the other clause is that if the block number is uh, larger than T2 and the token predicate uh, on the token in the token partition is other than X, then uh, key Z controls the bill. And the idea is that the key Y is, uh, is a public key of, uh, of the party or of the user who is selling the token, the asset on the other partition, and key Z is, uh, is a public key of the original owner of the bill in the bill partition. And now what, what after, after the buyer of a, of a token, this is basically uh, pu a, putting this predicate onto, onto, onto the bill by buyers. This is a buyer's commitment to pay this bill for the token. And what the token owner now can do in the other, con um, other, uh, uh, other uh, partition is uh, they can set the token predicate to X which presumably is a script that the buyer has, uh, has prescribed, which assigns a token now to the buyer's uh, public key. And, uh, and then uh, if the token is in fact transferred in the, other, in the token partition, then the seller is the interested party to communicate this information back to the bill partition to claim ownership of the bill because they have done their part of the deal. They have transferred the ownership of the token and they are interested in getting the ownership of the bill as promised by the, by the by the new bill predicate. And if uh, for whatever reason the, the seller declines to transfer the ownership of the token in the token partition, then the, the buyer, the would-be buyer of the token is the interested party to achieve after, after the time T2, uh, uh, the, the timeout has elapsed, to, to collect evidence from the, from the token partition that the token hasn't still been transferred. And, and the, the, the uh, the buyer of the token then is the interested party collects evidence that the token hasn't been transferred and therefore the deal is now null and void and the, the bill can return to the buyer because uh, the, 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 the buy and sell operation didn't really complete. So this is a kind of uh, way where you can do, uh, 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 you, 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 can, you can implement a, a, a global, uh, more complicated transaction as a set of more local operations, which each of them can be implemented and verified efficiently with no cross shard or no cr cross partition communication inside the platform needed. And there seems to be a question. Yeah, is there, how do you deal with you know, the, somebody thinking the transaction is done, but it run, it's, it's run out of time? Uh, this is why the T1 and T2 are there. So if, if the transaction goes forward, then it has to happen before time T1. 
and, and then uh, to, to ac account for the, for the potential time delay to transfer the, the proof uh, that the transaction did happen uh, back to the bill partition, uh, you can have a kind of uh, safety time barrier between the time, time limit T1 and time limit T2. And if the information isn't there by time limit T2, then the owner can, can get their bill back. So does, that's, does the other partition know what those two times are? Uh, the other partition doesn't need to know what those two times are. The other partition is only concerned that the seller transfers uh, the ownership of the token to the buyer and the seller should do it in the correct time. And the time units uh, there in this partition, they are in the terms of the partition of the, of the token. Uh, in terms of the time or round numbers of the, of the a token partition. In case the partitions operate at the different clock speeds, then the proof whether the token was or was not transferred, this will be in terms of the time units of the token partition. And the, and the buyer should know what the time scale of the token partition is when writing this, this kind of uh, predicate. Or uh, most likely the, the wallet application of the buyer knows this and, uh, and puts the T, uh, T1 and T2 values accordingly. In between T1 and T2, the value of the predicate is simply not defined. Yeah, uh, you, you cannot do anything between those two times. You, you, you can't... Uh, so could you just repeat the question? Ah, it's a question, yeah. Uh, in between times T1 and T2, uh, the, the predicate's value is uh, undefined. So basically, this is uh, the buffer time uh, during which uh, neither the, the buyer nor the seller can do anything. To, to, to allow for a time for things to settle. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, the, the previous example was mostly about just, uh, just uh, moving things around, uh, which, uh, which you, you, we didn't really care about how those things came to be. So there was a bill, there was a token, and one, one, somebody wanted to, wanted to buy the token with a bill. But uh, the user-defined tokens, they actually offer, uh, on, on the user-defined tokens on AlphaBill, they actually offer a quite rich programming model by themselves. So uh, application developers can define their own token types, much like in, in any, any, uh, any conventional programming language, uh, a programmer can define their own, to their own data types. And both uh, tokens and the token types are represented as nodes in the state tree of the, of the user token partition. So uh, not, not only the tokens and their states, but also the type definitions are protected by, by the integrity protection mechanism of the, of the uh, blockchain state tree itself. And the, the Current definition of the user-defined token types distinguishes between fungible and non-fungible uh, tokens. So uh, uh, a, a fungible token uh, is something that represents an, a, an amount or volume of something, like a, an amount of money uh, is, is a typical example. And the non-fungible token is uh, something that has a specific distinct identity. So one token of this type is distinct for, from another token of this type, for example, uh, a piece of art or, or something like that. And each token refers, when a token is, is uh, ref represented in the state tree, each token refers to its type by the node identifier of the, of the type. And uh, the standard operations supported for fungible tokens are they can be created, they can be transferred, uh, they can be split. So you can take a larger bill and split into two smaller ones, and they can be joined. So you can take two smaller bills and join them into one larger bill, uh, which is uh, convenient if you want to make an exact payment. And non-fungible tokens, they can be uh, created and transferred. They cannot be split, uh, split because uh, they have a, this atomic, uh, atomic nature, and they can also not be joined because if you take uh, two, two things with distinct identities, uh, and try to join them, then what, what is the identity of the new thing? You, you can't just smash two pieces of art together and, and have a new piece of art, even though some abstract artist might try. 
but uh, this is not something that uh, the AlphaBill programming model supports. What the AlphaBill programming model supports for uh, non-fungible tokens, they can have a, a, a piece of data, some, some sort of status associated with it, and, and it's possible to update this, uh, this uh, state. And uh, what, what the token type does uh, is it, 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 the token type, in addition to serve as a kind of a grouping of, uh, of tokens of the same type and uh, allowing to tell the difference between, uh, between um, uh, an NFT from one set of, uh, from one collection to, to an, uh, from an NFT from another collection, for example, by token. Uh, they also, uh, a token type can specify conditions which uh, automatically apply to all tokens of this type. Uh, and and this, uh, this is uh, enforced uh, by the platform, uh, by, the, by the validation rules uh, in this uh, user-defined token, uh, token partition. So, for example, uh, an, an artist uh, creating an NFT can, can first define a type uh, for, for this NFT, uh, which specifies that, uh, that uh, all NFTs of this type can only be sold if a commission is paid uh, as part of the sale transaction, if a commission is paid or, or a transaction fee uh, has been paid to the original creator of the token. So uh, the, the original creator of the token can, can earn, uh, earn every time uh, somebody uh, sells or, or buys uh, their tokens. And, and because this is recorded in the token type, this cannot be uh, overridden or changed, this limitation by, by any subsequent transaction operating on the, on the token, uh, because uh, the token type definition is, it's itself is immutable. Once it is, uh, is created, it cannot be changed uh, after the fact. So anybody coming, uh, coming in and, and starting to use a token, they know uh, ahead of time what the conditions are that the token type uh, imposes on this token and, and they can then make fully informed decision on whether they want or, or do not want to buy the token under those terms, for example. Uh, the type system uh, on the AlphaBill platform is also hierarchical. So not only is there a, 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 a type where you can then start creating tokens of this type, but uh, when you define a type, uh, you can optionally start also defining subtypes. And um, and a token type uh, defines uh, actually th three main things. So the first is uh, who can define subtypes. So uh, this, this condition can be set to be permanently false, which uh, effectively means, uh, means uh, a sealed or final class in, in object-oriented programming terms that you cannot derive further subtypes from this. Uh, but you can also uh, put, uh, put some, some more interesting condition on who can and who cannot uh, define subtypes. And uh, you can also uh, set the condition or, or a token type also defines who can create tokens of this type. So this is again, if you set it to be permanently false, then you have basically created an abstract base class which cannot be instantiated in, uh, in object-oriented programming terms. Uh, but uh, normally, then uh, a, a normal use case, normal and more, perhaps more interesting use case is that uh, a creator of the token type can define that only they can create tokens of this type. And once they have created those tokens, they can then sell or, or otherwise transfer them, but, but they will be on control uh, over uh, what, what tokens and, and how many and under what conditions are created. And each token type also defines an invariant clause, which uh, then all tokens of this type uh, in, inherit into their bearer predicates. So there, uh, this is a mechanism how a token type sets restrictions on the tokens of this type, which cannot be lifted by the, by the token creators. They are imposed uh, by, by the very definition of the token type. And, and the, uh, when, when a subtype of a token type is defined, it inherits the invariant clauses uh, and can add their own more. But say, uh, unlike, uh, unlike the, uh, uh, the programming model of some object-oriented languages, a subclass or, or a subtype cannot override the condition in such a way as to lift the ref restrictions that has al already been imposed by a, uh, by a, a parent type. So a subtype can, can add additional restrictions, but cannot remove or, or, or undo restrictions based by a supertype. 
So this means that when, when, a, when a base type is created and some condition is defined in that base type, this applies recursively to all tokens of this type and also to all tokens of all subtypes of this type. And uh, maybe we, we can look at, the, at an example. Uh, so we can uh, define a, a base type to represent university di diplomas as, uh, as uh, user-defined tokens. And this uh, can be defined, it, it would make good sense to define it as an abstract base type because there is no such thing as, uh, as, as a generic university diploma. University diploma is always in some subject and, and a generic university diploma doesn't exist. Uh, and this means that uh, no, no tokens can be created. So the, the token creation clause can be uh, set uh, for this type to be permanently false to define an abstract base class or an abstract base type. And uh, subtypes uh, can be defined by the same ministry who created uh, the general, uh, the abstract uh, token type for the university diplomas. And then uh, uh, the inheritable or invariant clause for the token predicates is that no transfers are allowed. Indeed, uh, once, uh, it, it, this is a, a, a property that you expect from all university diplomas. Once a diploma has been issued to somebody, this is a non-transferable asset. You cannot sell your diploma to somebody else, even if you, even if you are the legitimate bearer or, or, or a carrier of the diploma. And, and then you, you can, uh, the Ministry of Education, who created the uh, abstract base types, they can then define concrete subtypes like diploma in physics, diploma in mathematics, diploma in chemistry, and, and put on those subtypes, they can put the conditions that accredited institutions with, uh, with the programs is in, uh, in the corresponding subjects, they can start issuing tokens, which would then be actual diplomas. But then uh, a, a, an institution who has a program in physics can issue a, a diploma in physics, but cannot issue a diploma in, uh, in medicine because they don't have a medicine program in, in that institution, perhaps. And then each token represents a, a specific diploma recording who got it on in which year. And, uh, and since already in this abstract base type, uh, it was defined that diplomas cannot be transferred, then this non-transferability transfer, non uh, restriction is inherited through the, through the subtypes to each of those tokens. So ju just, just by the nature of being a, of a type of a subtype of a diploma, all of those tokens are automatically non-transferable. Of course, in, in practical terms, uh, the, there is a lot more details to be considered, like diploma can be revoked and, and all, all of those things. So, and, and also, uh, maybe, maybe in, in this sense, diplomas are not the best example, uh, because uh, at, at least in some countries, uh, educational information is considered uh, uh, private personal data, which should not be out on a public blockchain in the first place. But uh, as a way of explaining the concept, uh, I hope this example is uh, useful. Yes? Uh, can you inherit from two parents? Uh, in the first version of the Alpha Build platform, no. Maybe we will think about it in future, but uh, for now, uh, the feeling is that it gets, uh, the, the rules get too complicated and too messy. So for now, there is single inheritance. But uh, good question, yes. And then uh, smart contracts. Uh, you, can, you can view smart contracts as, a, as kind of a special case of user-defined token representing some behavior of logic. But uh, we intend to implement smart contracts as a separate partition with, uh, with different, uh, different uh, uh, transaction types and, uh, and validation logic to make uh, programming uh, smart contracts in, in generic uh, or in general form uh, more, more convenient. And, uh, and in general, uh, a smart contract is, uh, as, as you expect, is, is an object uh, in the state tree consisting of some internal state uh, plus some methods to, in, uh, to update, to change the internal state. And uh, each method is, is, a, is, is a separate predicate or a predicate clause to validate the request for change. So depending on, uh, on what kind of uh, 
change or, or basically in, in again in, in object or in, in common object oriented programming terms depending on what kind of method you want to call on this smart contract there is a validation logic whether the method call is, is valid whether the change that uh, the method call asks from the state of the contract uh, corresponds to the business rules of the contract and whether the requester is, is authorized to, to issue this request and if, if this passes then <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the change is applied to the to the state of the contract, and uh, and the predi predicates uh, making up the smart contracts they are linked to each other. They communicate with each other uh, while while changing the, the internal state, uh, the sh shared state. But the important thing is that the shared state is local to a single contract, so uh, there is no uh, shared state across contracts. If, if you want to program a more complicated transaction that affects multiple smart contracts, again, the message passing uh, paradigm is, is used to, to connect those things. And this means that uh, because there is no uh, cross-contract uh, shared state, uh, the, the partition for smart contracts can also be freely sharded for performance. And this basically provides uh, unlimited sharding and unlimited capabilities for parallel processing of those smart contracts. Uh, each, each smart contract receiving a message can, can act on, on this message based on its own local internal state only, and it doesn't need to concern itself with uh, states of other contracts. If, uh, if a more complicated transaction needs to, needs to uh, take into consideration uh, states from multiple contracts, then uh, the, the, the corresponding uh, messages have, have to be formed, have to be carried into the, into the affected smart contract. Uh, and then, again, the decision in the affected smart contract to do or do not to do the, the change or the transaction is, is made locally. And the result of this decision can again be propagated back to those other uh, contracts via messages again. And this is a general programming, uh, programming model. How, how we see uh, how we can do smart contracts which, which can operate, uh, which are oper uh, parallelizable and, and therefore can, uh, can operate in this uh, sharded uh, framework, in this sharded model. And that's uh, in a nutshell uh, all I wanted to say today. So thank you. Uh, are there perhaps any questions lingering? Yes. How would you contrast this to the Ethereum model of smart contracts? Uh, well, the main thing with Ethereum smart contracts is that uh, uh, the contrast is, is exactly that in the Ethereum model, the whole state of the whole world is, is a single shared state across all, all contracts. So there is necessarily synchronization needed on, at the platform level between the contracts. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, I, I do admit that the message passing based uh, model in, uh, in AlphaBill um, may make the programmer's life a bit more complicated. Hopefully this can be, uh, can be helped with, uh, with good tooling in the future. But uh, if, you, if you really have to write your uh, predicates in this uh, bytecode or, or this low level assembly manually, you have to do a bit more thinking about how the, those multiple contracts interact and, uh, and how the message passing is, is guaranteed to always work, even if, if some messages might not be passed, then you need to think about what is a good uh, fallback. Like in the case of, uh, of the timeout in the, in the buying of the token with a bill that we had on, I think, slide three, this example. And, but, uh, but the upside is that uh, we can offer basically unlimited scalability. And this has been, uh, good scalability has been a primary design goal of the Alpha Bill platform from, from day one. And, uh, and our bets are on that this uh, trade off that we have made, this will pay off. Yeah, and Ethereum 2.0 is trying to do sharding, right? Do they do message passing? Uh, I, I actually I don't know how to answer that question, so I have to. Any pause. Ethereum experts in the audience? Please don't. Yes, we do. We have a special uh, to hold the vehicle chain. Because 
soft task and one soft task is handled by, by one of the 64 partitions. So um, this is passing is like uh, basically a communication channel. It's not part of the programming model. It's just the necessary thing. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I would call it uh, message passing. It's uh, a federated blockchain which uses uh, central another blockchain instance for uh, delivering messages to other shards. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope this answered your question. Uh, any other uh, questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in a, one slide about uh, dealers, the predicate example had a clause. If a predicate is set to X, then something happens. Mm -hmm. But it looks to me that the predicate is used for a code and also for state storage. So it's a code and data at, uh, at the same time. It's, uh, yeah, in some ways you can see, uh, let me go back to this slide where it was. In some ways you can see, uh, yeah, you can say that if the predicate contains uh, the question, does the signature on the transaction order validate with public key X, you can consider the value X part of data or part of the state of the token. And, and, uh, and I think that's an okay view. I, I don't think there is a big contradiction in there. Because uh, in, in most programming models, there is some sort of volatility between code and data. You can, you, 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 if you have a very strict separation of code and data, you basically can't write a compiler. Because uh, the thing that a compiler gets as input is, is code in, in, in source form. What's a code output, what's a program output, the compiler as a program output, it is still uh, in, in programming model view, it should be data, but it is actually code that will next be executed. So at some point, there is this place where, where the data ceases to be a data and becomes code. And, and here also, you can, you can, um, you can view this model in, in multiple ways. You can, you can consider X uh, as part of the state of the token, or you can consider it uh, as data. And then, uh, then this uh, transfer, if you, if you see it, uh, if you consider it as, as part of code, then the transfer, is, uh, transfer operation is basically a metaprogramming, uh, an operating on the, on the program that controls uh, the, the predicate. Or you can, you can view it, uh, that uh, the predicate is, uh, is a condition of defining the ownership of the, of the token and then the transfer is, is a regular program which, which changes the state of the token to belong to a new owner. And, and the more complicated case, yeah, the, the token predicate set to X, uh, this again, this is uh, the, the, the validation of the predicate means, uh, maybe I should have been a bit more detailed, is that from the other partition where the token lives, uh, the, the message contains a proof what is the new state of the token in the token partition. And, and then you can, uh, you can view the X. Again, in this context, you can view it as a, as a piece of data. You verify that the, that the better predicate the section of the state of the token in the token partition uh, in the evidence that you received as a message from the other partition, that it, it contains a script X that you expect to be there. But as, as far as uh, a uh, uh, predicate here is concerned, X looks like data, but then when you try to transact with the token further, it, it, it starts behaving the X in, in, in there. In this context, it starts to behaving like, uh, like code that is executed to, to determine if the next transaction with the token is valid. So that was a quite long answer to a short question, which yeah, tends to be the case with, uh, with such uh, sim seemingly simple philosophical questions, <laughs> whether it's code or data. Can we go back to the, can we go back to the example of the uh, academic uh, credentials? How would you introduce privacy into this model? Or you, you, know, you, you can have a credential where you, you don't disclose private information, but you can still verify. So there is this notion of, uh, of zero knowledge proofs where you can do, uh, where, where you can keep some data off the chain and you can even operate on, on, on this data off the chain. And then you can bring back to the chain uh, proof that the data has some properties that is required, that the operations uh, done on the data have some properties that are required by the business model. But you, you, and you can show the proof, but you don't have to show the data itself. 
Uh, we don't have it implemented in Alphabill uh, at the moment, but uh, uh, and there will be a separate talk about uh, what are the thoughts, how we plan to in the future to deploy those uh, zero knowledge uh, techniques to to improve privacy and also potentially at some point the uh, performance of uh, of smart contracts on on Alphabill. I guess one of the unique things about Alphabill is because it is you can go all the way down to a single token you know, in this partitioning that you can do the zero knowledge proofs on a per token basis, which may not be as easy to do in an account based model. Yes, so that's the key why we think uh, those zero knowledge techniques can actually actually scale to practical levels uh, with alpha build much more easily than with other uh, with other uh, platforms where the states that you have to consider as input to your uh, zero knowledge uh, proof is much bigger and uh, and it is well known that uh, uh, the current uh, current uh, generation zero knowledge proofs are quite computationally expensive uh, compared to the size of the data or uh, compared to the number of operations that you do on this data to prove that, uh, that those things have been correct. So the, uh, limiting the size of the input to your, uh, the, 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 the size of the data that you want to prove something about is of critical importance for performance. Any more questions? If not, then thank you. I hope it was, it was interesting and useful and uh, see you in the next session.